May I welcome and request uh, uh, Dr. Kambeli uh, Begashu, uh, then to please uh, come and, and uh, you know make your uh, your remarks. I, I hope uh, uh, one uh, representative of the vice chancellor, uh, I have not let you down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Njuro, for very <coughs> warm welcome. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's great to be here this afternoon. Especially great to be here with a great speaker from the region, our sister, Dr. Biko. We've been working um, very closely with the university leadership for the last three, four weeks for uh, this important event. And I'm happy that um, with the leadership of the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Mutsuro and his team, um, this event today is um, warmly materialized. My job this afternoon is very simple. I just want to say hello, to say thank you to all of you, and to vanish um, the workload and uh, the sense and substance part of this afternoon's presentation will be handled by our sister, Dr. Biko, who is the practitioner, the fashionist, and uh, the daughter of the land, and also a person um, who would like to go beyond ordinary duties and responsibilities, taking leadership, steerhead with all kinds of confrontation and challenge that time is um, always supplying to her. I will not going to say much about that because she's going to to say it, and finally you're going to comment on that. My name is Balai Bagashiao, and on behalf of Columbia Global Center for Africa in Nairobi, which I direct, I would like to welcome you here today to the second lecture in our public, public lecture series, which we are very proud to provide in partnership with the University of Nairobi. Can I just begin by thanking the University of Nairobi for having us, and thank you, you too, you the audience, for joining us here today, particularly after the events of the past few weeks. I'm sure that today marks the beginning of a partnership between ourselves and the university. Before I hand over to Professor Mutsuro, I just want to make a few remarks about the center which I direct. Columbia Global Center for Africa, and about the aims of this lecture series. As you may know, in this part of the world, Columbia University is known for, among other things, contributing to the fight against poverty undertaken by African governments under the umbrella of the Millennium Development Goals, as well as known initiatives such as public health initiatives such as ICAP, where our public health international centers for AIDS, health treatments, and programs. Some two years ago, Columbia University decided to set up a Columbia Global Center in Nairobi as part of its strategy of ensuring that the university is fit for purpose in an ever more connected, globalized world. The leadership of Columbia University recognized that finding solutions to the problems of the 21st century requires a global perspective. Knowing more about the world, such that we are able to scrutinize potential solutions from multiple viewpoints, and hence arrive at the best course of action. 
Consequently, there are now eight Columbia Global Centers around the world, which aim to ensure that Columbia University students are 21st century scholars equipped with hands-on global experience. And that Columbia University is helping to enrich the local research and public policy agenda, including by partnering with local universities. Since formally launched just over a year ago, our center keeps expanding its horizon and now also hosts, among other things, the Melman Public School Human Nutrition Program, the Africa Soil Information Service, or APSIS, and the Laboratory of School of Engineering and Applied Science focused on IT-based solutions. Several other Columbia University schools and faculties, such as College of Dental Medicine, and the School of Undergraduate Studies are building partnership with local institutions, including the University of Nairobi. We're also looking beyond the time frame of the MDGs, providing academic and technical input to the UN Secretary General on the post-2015 Global Development Agenda and Sustainable Development Goals. One of the aims of our public lecture series, of which today's lectures a part, is to promote awareness in Kenya and the region of some of the best research ideas and approach from Columbia University and elsewhere to encourage discussion and debate of that. The other equally important aim of our public lecture series is to showcase to Columbia University and beyond the best research ideas and approach coming out of Kenya and the region and encourage their discussion and debate. As such, we're delighted to welcome here today the daughter of the region, Dr. Mohammed. I will leave it up to Professor Muturo to give her a proper introduction. However, I just wanted to say on behalf of the center I direct that we are very grateful to Dr. Mohammed for agreeing to share with us today her and her family's experience over the past three decades and their hopes and plans for the future at a time when Somalia is at crossroads. I think we in the region, and indeed the whole world, can't wait to see Somalia putting the past permanently behind it and fulfilling the hopes and dreams of its citizens. Our experience in development shows time and again that development is challenging in a stable environment. How much harder it must be where there is no peace and security nor a functioning government for a, gener for a generation. I believe it is a great economist, Professor Paul Collins, who describes civil war as a development in reverse. But even this doesn't begin to capture the whole scale of upheaval of normal life, displacement of entire communities, nor suffering and heartbreak of families. I leave to history to assess the contribution of you and your family to Somalia and its people. But as citizens of Africa and as a fellow human being, can I just say a personal note of thanks and that we are very much looking forward to what you have to tell us today. Finally, a brief word about the format of today's lecture. Today, the most important people in the room will speak last, you, the audience. After Dr. Mohammed has spoken, she will then take questions from the audience. We are looking forward to hearing your questions and comments and to learning from you. Dr. Mohammed will then sign copies of her mother's book, Keeping Hope Alive, quote unquote, which will take place just outside, outside this lecture chair. Copies are available for sale, I guess. And I learned that it's only 2,500 Kenyan children. Thank you very much, and we hope you enjoy today's lecture. Now it is my great pleasure to invite to the podium Professor Mutsuro, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs of the University of Nairobi, to say a few words and introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Dr. Deko Mohammed and your sisters. 
and the family present here. Director Columbia Global Centers Africa, uh, Director Billy Bekashaw, who has just spoken, the Principal College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Professor Enos Njeru, Deans and Directors, Chairman of Departments here present, staff, students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the University of Nairobi and particularly to this lecture by Dr. Deko Mohammed. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always a pleasure to welcome those who honor the University of Nairobi by giving a lecture at this university, which has been the venue for public intellectual engagement in this country for a long time indeed. I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely apologize for not being able to host last week's public lecture due to the industrial action that had paralyzed the activities in all public universities. I am pleased to inform you now that all that we are now back to normal operations. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the idea that academic endeavor is more valuable when it makes a contribution to our world which inspires us in our research and our view of education. To this end, the University of Nairobi is keen on holding intellectual discourse and disseminating this information to the community. We are the highest ranked institution in the region and we have in place over 200 active local and international collaborations and academic agreements with institutions of higher learning and organizations. Saying that we are the best ranked, you might not know, but I think stand now, the University of Nairobi is holding position one in Kenya, in East Africa, and position nine among the best 10 on the continent. Uh, we can boast and say we're actually number one in Africa, south of the Sahara, and north of the Limbopo. Isn't that an achievement? <laughs> I welcome Columbia University to collaborate with the University of Nairobi because they will be collaborating with the best and we also deal only with the best. I am informed that there exists a collaboration of a series of lectures already lined up through this partnership. And Director Bekshaw has told me that and we are going to develop more given that we already have existing relations with Columbia University, particularly in the area of peace education. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker today. Dr. Deko Mohammed is a medical doctor. The chief executive officer of the Dr. Hawa Abdi Foundation, DHAF, and daughter of Dr. Hawa Abdi. She's going to tell us more about that. Hawa Abdi is actually the mother. And she will tell us what the mother has done to humanity or for humanity. Dr. Mohammed will speak on the challenges her family has faced over the past three decades and their plans 
for the future. She will not be talking about development in reverse, like Dr. Beckshaw gave an indication that you see civil war means development. I was quoting some expert. And I think in spite of all that, what did the mother do for humanity in Somalia? In 1983, Dr. Abdi began providing free obst obstetrician, obstetrician services to around 24 old women per day from a one-room clinic on family-owned land in the Lower Shebel region in Somalia. Since then, in the face of civil war and open oppression of women, her, her family, and the foundation have treated over two million Somali refugees, women, and children. Isn't that an achievement? Makofi, please. In 2012, Dr. Abdi was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for her work. And in 2010, Glamour named Dr. Abdi and her daughters Women of the Year and called them the Saints of Somalia. Makofi Tena. <laughs> Makofi Tena, for those who don't know, means what they are doing. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Indeed, there is something that we can learn from the courage, compassion, and tolerance of, the, of Dr. Abdi and her family. I wish to encourage you all to buy copies of the Dr. Abdi's book, Keeping Hope Alive, which is available for sale. We have a lot to learn from that, and perhaps by reading it, we may be called upon one, on one, one of these days to perhaps try and see if we can do likewise. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to invite Dr. Deko Mohammed to deliver her lecture. Welcome, Dr. Deko Mohammed. Thank you, Professor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are here, and I'm presenting, and I will share the work my mother did. Actually, it's not me. I'm just accelerating, and I'm there for her, and I'm CEO of the foundation. But today, we, I want to share with you an amazing woman who's my mother, and a strong woman and leader in the face of my country. So when we go in, in the abroad and in Somalia, she's presenting to her country. Uh, we flee. We went to different countries. We changed our IDs. We changed our passport. But she refused. She said, I will, um, I'm born in Somalia, and I will die in Somalia. So she traveled with her passport, with Somali passport, all over the world, and telling, look, this is my passport. I came to share my idea, but I, I didn't come to stay with your country. So she's very strong and have a very great idea. I would like, before I start my lecture, to share with you to show her video, and you can hear from her own voice, her struggle, and how she achieved where she is today. Then I will go for work she's doing the details. I, I hope you can listen and focus. My mother was dreaming that I will be a great person. She became pregnant with her seventh child when I was 11 years old. As her stomach swelled, she felt weakness and pain. But she said, no problem, Hawa. Everything will be okay. Whether it comes to us through violence, disease, or even childbirth, death is not the end of our story. You have to get up and help someone who needs you. I became a doctor because I wanted to save others from feeling the pain I felt when my mother died. The Somalia I grew up in was so much different than today. Mogadishu was the best place in all Africa. In the rural area, children had fresh milk, fresh meat, fresh air. Life was very beautiful, very simple, and very peaceful. 
party started to go bad in 1988 when the government collapsed. More and more people come to us to escape the fighting. The Somali people have tradition of hospitality. When a traveler comes to you, you have to give him the best of what you have. It seems only natural that the problems we could solve, like giving someone a place to stay and a feeling of safety, should be solved. When space became full, family began to sleep under the trees. After more than 20 years, it became 90,000 people. These people have become my family. Here we are all Somalis. If you want to identify with your clan, you cannot stay. In time, my children become doctors, and now we work together. Each crisis we face gives way to the next as a new group takes control of our area. Sometimes these children, with their guns, they told me, you are an old woman, you cannot be in church. I said, and you are a strong young man, what have you done for these people? Whether to fighting or famine, we have lost as many as 50 people per day. But we get up, we go on, and we help someone who needs us. Today our one-room clinic is a 400 beds hospital. I live for the hope that peace will come, that my children and my grandchildren will someday know that Somali I love. Until that time, they can build on what I have started. I am Dr. Hawa Abdi. This is my vital voice. Now, raise yours. This is why we're here, to raise your vital voice. My mother was and dreaming I cannot that. feel on that shoes. She's amazing. And me and my sister, we're trying to do our best. She, she's the mother, she's the mind for us, but she, we are the force moving. We are the energy, we're young, we need to make a change, but she did for us. She implemented for us. That's what we need to focus for now. I'm gonna talk in details what the foundation is doing on the ground, and and I will try to be brief and precise, and I will give you um, for you more questions so you can ask in details if you have any question in Somalia. But today we are here for Dr. Hawa, and we're here to raise your vital voices. We believe every person in this room or anywhere in the world has a vital voices. It's just the time to stand up and raise your vital voice. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like to g give you a little brief history about Somalia, if you're not familiar with Somalia. Uh, Somalia people know most of you guys, young people. Oh, great, this is my, okay, technology, I'm bad, yes. I'm learning. Uh, <coughs> so Somalia, we know most of this room, I think more than 50% know Somalia for war, for piracy, for starvation, but I think my mom gave you a brief history about when she was young in early 60s and 70s and how brilliant was Somalia and how different is Somalia in her time. And I'm gonna share with you, Somalia is not that bad at all. Somalia is not um, piracy and rape and war. Somalia still, there's another phase. I'm gonna maybe complete your picture you had before because the rest of the world or media are portraying a half of picture, it's always not showing the full picture of what's going on in every corner of, uh, all the, of the world. So I'm gonna try to share you whole picture of Somalia, starting a little bit about the history of the foundation, as my mom told you, she started her clinic in 1983 to focus on rural health area, where in the lower Shabelle region, which is in really not far from Mogadishu. Really it's not far from the clinics and the cities, but still there is a difficulties, they don't have the hospitals, they don't have a clinic, they don't have even proper midwives in her time in, in early 80s until now. You can find a few doctors and nurses. So my mom, what she did is she moved from the city close to them within the Chavelle region where she's originally from and where we, where we had a land so she can establish a study, okay? Did I mess it up with something? <laughs> okay, 
technology. Um, so she started with one room clinic and today I have to run 400 bed capacity and I have to run in 126 employee in the foundation and daily we see between 100 to 200 patients. Uh, we have uh, now at the moment in the camp we have about 6,000 people living in because the peace and security people went back into their homes but we, that's the numbers I have to deal with. I grew up being a refugee. I'm kind of what I call Somali generation who got lost. You just start in understanding what is going on and you face a war. The, the day war started me personally, it was I, we had a, a midterm exams and my mom was telling me, you cannot go to school. And to me, missing a midterm exam, it seems like this is big thing. I have to go to school. So that is how we grew up. We haven't seen a peaceful Somalia. We were not lucky as my mother enjoyed her time of seeing her countries prosper and grow and peaceful. But we have seen a refugees, we have seen a war. And when you come outside, we, I study in Russia, I went to US, I travel a lot in the world. And you talk to the kids in the rest of the world, they will tell you the, you know, the cartoons of the childhood lives. But when you go back to Somalia and you talk like 10 years old child in Somalia, he will tell you which gun they just shoot. Is AK-47, is, uh, I don't know what they call, like, the kids know better than I do. So instead of knowing the cartoons or uh, child life and playing, they deal sitting, you know, betting to who is shooting now. Is that the government? Is that the group? Is that the warlord? So we are creating in Somalia a generation that kind of lost. And this is not only dangerous. Maybe you think, OK, this is the problem of Somalia. But the way my mother sees and the way we see, this is a problem for the whole world. This is issues coming up. We are raising like 9 million people who don't know what peace means, who has no idea what means a normal communication and life. So this is a job. It's not only for Somalis. This is a job for the whole world. Whatever country like Somalia, we need to focus to change. We're raising a generation. Not only they grew up not knowing what means peace and prosperity and education, they grew up also another deficiency, which means malnutrition. These children, the important years of their life, which is means a year to five years, they haven't get any protein. So we're raising incapable kids who are mentally unfit to the rest of the world, and we want to deal with them. So how we can stop this issue together? So I was, Vanessa asked me, what's going to be your lecture? And I said, I don't know if I name something. Maybe let's, I, I was very, you know, overwhelmed what is going on in Somalia and where I have to focus today to talk the, the issue. It's not only raising your right of voice, it's also putting dots together. How we can solve these issues? Our generation is much easier. My mom's generation, early 60s, they need to fight tremendous problems. The problem is or we don't have, even we don't dream for now. We think, okay, that's unexisted. But we are much luckier. We have technology, we have a knowledge, we have young generation, we have, you can say word today and end of the world will know. That's the beauty of technology. We can share our ideas and we can solve our problems in instantly today. So we are in a great environment, we're in a great century, but also this century can destroy. If we look on the other side, we can destroy in second, which is another biggest problem we are facing now. So going back to the foundation, as I say, we focus on healthcare, education, and agriculture. My mom is the biggest fan of agriculture, even during the war, even during the fight where when we, raid, when we uh, grow some maize and just the transporting from your farm to your home, you had to pay 10 checkpoints and you had to pay money or corp. This, she, was, she was still farming. She believed strongly if we don't farm, the farm will die and people will forget how to farm or we cannot survive for only WFB food. If the people here don't know WFB World Food Program, Somali for the last 23 years was living on World Food Program. Basically 90% of the country was living World Food Program. So to stop that and to uh, have sustainability, you need to give people ability and tools to, to stand their feet. You cannot feed for 20 years, 23 years. You cannot feed for centuries. 
the world has to think, do we need to continue this war? Or we need to give people skills and tools and opportunity and peace so they can be self-dependent? That is the question is sitting in front of us today as well. Do we need to continue this NGO world? Do we need to give only donations? Do we need to create a whole generation of whole continent maybe dependent on the other continents? Are we willing to do that? That we just have to ask questions. Your young generation, your future generation, you need to ask yourself that. Um, this is the hospital my mom talked. It started with one room. You cannot see it's uh, in the corner, the room she started. And now this is the big. My mom is an Italian fan. I don't know what she was trying to build when she started the hospital. But now that's a 400 bedroom hospital. Is with my, some people, when I showed the confusion, is this hotel or is this connection? Or this is hospital <laughs> that built by Dr. Hawa Abdi, one woman by bit by bit with different help, of course, friends and families and NGOs. But today we have and that hospital. Um, this is our outside OB, uh, outpatient dispenser. You see this line was taken in three years ago, and this the corner one as the fresh new ones was taken just a weeks ago. That's how we have our outpatient. Every morning, women are coming. If you could see uh, the picture, I couldn't find any male except our worker, I think. So every single day, our employees or our um, patient who's coming to us in the hospital, 98% are female and children. So you hardly see less than 2% old male coming in for some wound or something. So the male, even they don't, we lost the even culture of Somali fathers to bring when their children are sick. So that's a uh, female issue. Your child sick, go to the hospital, it's not my work. So there's a lot of cultural aspects <laughs> you need to work on it. But that's what we face every day. And we are very lucky. My mom was by herself in the early 90s and uh, 80s. And later on, we came join her. We had the capacity now to hire other doctors. While I'm traveling, I can travel peacefully because I know on the ground we have other three doctors are doing the work. We have people are we trained, that's people my mother trained. So we know the hospital is capable to deal in all the aspects on the ground. So I'm very lucky and I'm very proud to be CEO. The foundation that was built it up. I'm just like putting the, what you call, um, last touches on the work. Um, okay, it's not moving. Okay. Here is uh, the two aspects mainly we face. It's malnutrition, which is in the middle. You can see in pneumonia, it's seasonal, very the highest in number we have in Somalia, especially the raining season, the environment they're in, the lack of food, and the lack of immune system for themselves. And another thing we're facing is the burn, which we don't have yet in Somalia a burn unit at all. Because the environment they're living in with the small hats with the clothes, each other, because the hats made by wood and we, we cook by fire. So you can see every single day 10 to 5 cases of children who was just running around the bushes, you know, running around to get their mothers cooking and they get burned. So it's another higher number we're facing in our emergency room. That's our OT room and I'm very proud of it. We have two OT. We can operate instantly to operation, which is a abdominal or anything we have. ICRC is supporting us in our surgical department when it comes to equipment and supplies. That ICRC is the biggest support in our uh, OT department. Um, this is the hospital inside, and in the corner I get close these pictures. This is a pediatric ward. You can see the children are in, and we are very busy on the ground. These beds were. Uh, donated by MSF, MSF trained most of our, before 2007 we didn't have a pediatric. MSF came in, trained the team, built the pediatric for almost 150 beds and equipped the area and was working there for three years. After three years they were closed and all MSF left and the last you know, MSF left at all in Somalia. That, this is the aspect we losing. This is the work MSF used to do. This is the people who suffering on the ground and that's, it's, it's gone now, and we are trying to, to do our best to continue the work of MSF. This is our great team of doctors in this corner, and that's our young generation. What we do is that we have a lot of training on job training on the ground, and to, one of the greatest aspects I love to train is the boys. 
to fight against the war so they don't go with any groups, they don't go outside of the streets. That we have a lot of mothers coming in to say, can you train my child? I want him to stay in, this, in the hospital. I don't want him to be in the war zone. I don't want him to be on the streets. So we created uh, this environment where they can, when they come in the first, they can put themselves a white coat. They can feel a doctor. They can feel more important, needed in society. I had a lot of visitors when they come to school, to the hospital, they say, you have more patient, you have more staff than patient. I say, this is a student. I'm glad we have more staff than patient. But I try to explain, you know, we, we open our doors because we are preventing a child soldier. We're preventing the kids to be on the street. We, we're building a whole new generation to be self-dependent, to be knowing what means a normal life. That's what we're doing, and that's why we're welcoming them. This is our village. It's a beautiful, we try, it's not, it's not, uh, it's still, it's green. We try to keep it green. My mother tried to, we try to have each family to have a tree if they can plant it as much. Sometimes we don't have water. If you could see in the lower Shabelle, the area we live in, it's a little bit sandy, close to the beach and, and in a, that area. So it's a quite, it gets quite hot and quite dry. So it's very hard to cultivate and, and plant a trees in dry season, especially in this time of the year from end of the year until April, end of April is very drought season. And this is the life of our village. You can see the corner picture a little bit far away from the village. This is how they build the Somali woman. And, and this, I really, when I looked this picture and I was talking to my mother, I remember when my mother tells me, Somali women were very strong and resilient for centuries. They are the one who used to build the houses. This is Somali huts. Uh, they are the one who used to rear the animals. They are the one who used to cook. They are the one who used to take care of the of uh, their children. And it's like my mother, when she tells me, and I was surprised, like, why? You know, within the society, we don't give a credit to poor women. Somali women are hardworking, are backbones of the society. But within the society, they're nobody. They just another part of hard working. You, you, you can hear, I know Somalis are sitting here, they, they say, you are the woman. You know, there's just like, and even the tone of telling you are the woman, it's just like, you are nothing. And what we, what we need to teach most of the society, especially, I, I just want to show you with a, with a small story. Uh, when we train our team, you know, young boys and children, we, we try to train them from beginning. They have to learn how to clean their own environment. So we were training the team of labs. So the lab should be very clean and sterile. So we had three new boys, you know, kind of between 14 to 19. So we told them, you know, this is your shift. You need to clean your area. You need to clean your environment. And they were saying, you know, uh, the girls are not here. This is the job of the girls. And they said, who say that? That's what we know. This is not my job. I am a man, I'm, I should not clean. And I say, if you cannot clean, if you cannot take care of yourself, you're not gonna stay here. This is different environment than you grow. So we have a whole different aspect of culture we need to fight and we need to learn the society. And, and that's how our Somali women, I think they're resilient and they're my heroes and they inspire me every single day. Me being in Somali, they wake up every morning at four and they sleep, go back to go to the bed around eight or seven at night. They work in that long hours trying to save the families and no one is giving them credit. And I think we should give them a strong credit to what they're doing. Uh, this is our water sanitation uh, area where they can get our water, clean water. We are one of the few luckiest uh, villages in the area. We do have two pool halls. One was uh, supported by ICRC, another one for MSF. So we can alternate, we can switch, we can you know, give one borehole break and use another one. We have plenty of water. We sometimes run out of the fuel to pump the water, especially dry season, you need to, to run more water. But is the, uh, we are the one of the few luckiest. The hospital is have enough water. The village has enough water anytime they need, they can find the water. Um, this is some of distribution water and food we do. Uh, before it was, as I say, we used to live with the WFP. Also, we distribute our own maize we grow, and whatever was donation, we get in different areas, in different support, uh, and in different NGOs, as the very um, poor families who cannot uh, work or farm. 
Okay. Next slide. Oh. This is my bride. This is our school. And I'm very proud of it. And we started with one, uh, about 50 children. Now we have around over 400, 350 for elementary and 60 for uh, daycare. We just opened daycare this year. So we try, uh, as you see, the girl, we just add this year art classes. So the girl in the corner, you can see she's trying to draw. And it's a new thing uh, because of we're very pleased to have on the ground a Kenyan teachers we introduce into the country a Kenyan system of education. So they're creating a lot of physical activities, a lot of things children are needed. Even the counseling we just started for a few weeks ago to, to counsel the kids. Even the teachers they needed for doing the counseling. So this is a new exciting year for educational system of our school. I, I love them. This is a baby class. It's just in developing area we just build in for them specific area for everything but they do come to the school and we give them a breakfast and lunch and we try to at least to start with hygiene and being disciplined and because they're very important age there we start our daycare from a year and a half up to six years for the school so they get enough nutrition they learn for discipline for very early age and rest as the rest of the family this picture is the young girl who's teaching at the baby class, which she's born in a hospital. She's 18 years old. She are in elementary school, just finished. And on the other hand, she's a teacher in our baby class. So she, her name is Anna Bay. So she's the one of, she doesn't know anywhere else except to the village. She's born, she get educated, and now she's working. She, her, her future is to become a teacher. Her, you know, hoping and she wants, she, she say, I want to become a teacher. So that's why we're giving her the opportunity to start earlier to practice and learn how to become a teacher and teach a baby classes. So she's a very active young girl. I'm very proud of it of her. Um, this is our baby class also early classes, and our teachers to take to try to capture uh, their smiling. <laughs> They're beautiful. I love them. They they made they are making my days. This is people I work for them. <laughs> this is their lunch time. They're eating and enjoying their lunch, and they're trying to make them laugh while they're taking the pictures. Uh, this is our farm. So if you could see this, we're farming and vegetables, and that season, the vegetables are beautiful, should come now, it's a dry season. We do have a capacity of farming about uh, 300 hectares, and we only farm in about 50 hectares. We don't have, uh, we do have opportunity to farm, I mean, 350 land but we we all our capacity is limited only 50 hectare because due to the watering and system and training and what we are producing we are introducing to them a, a smart farming so we they can use a small land and farm different vegetables and trees in that area so they can feed them fam their families um, i want to finish in my note this is uh peanut peanuts production and it's a new thing in Somalia, and I'm very proud to have in our village to produce our own peanuts on a, I mean, our own plumping net, what we call ready to use food for malnutrition children on the ground, on hand, made easy with a small, three people can do it. This is during the training, and we get most of the vitamins and peanuts from Nairobi and breast. We get the material like sugar and oil on the ground. And it's very basic to, to do it, to make it, and it's very useful. You can give the kids fresh produce for every week instead of shipping, and you have packages, and you have different foundations, and going for local. You have local made. You, you, you're creating empowerment of society. You're generating employment. You are in putting investment to the country also to empower the rest of the society. So it's very small, and it's the beginning of our foundation to have the, our own factory. We hope to have a lot of empowerment, things like this, to the society in Somalia, especially in Lower Shavala region. So I'm, I'm going to try to finish my speech in here, and I will try to summarize and say thank you. And the foundation has a lot of work. It's 30 years of work. I cannot share in 10, 15 minutes of lecture. And I will give you a platform to ask me more questions, and feel free to ask me anything including the politics and war and al-Shabaab, people get afraid. 
I, have, I was I was in a conference in Brasilia, and they were talking human rights, and and somebody was afraid, and they write it down. How many, you know, how you deal with Al Shabaab? And I say I can speak. Of it. You know, I live in Al Shabaab region, but I'm willing to to be honest and to speak as as a as a simple person, as a physician, not as a political level or as a as an aspect of different. But I can clarify some question if you want. But don't ask me a big question as a what the president is doing. That's for the government. And I think he's sitting here. The, the embassy of Somalia is here today. If you have a question for the government, you can ask this guy directly. <laughs> but if you have a civil society you know, question, as a woman, as a Somali physician, as dealing with FMG and bleeding and lack of medicine and lack of diagnostic, you feel free to ask me. And thank you for being here, and thank you for your time. I think that was a very, very pleasant lecture, very well delivered. Let's give her another applause, please. <laughs> now, how many of us are willing to volunteer to go to, to, to Somalia? There's a plane waiting out here. I will take you there. How many? OK, you see me after this, I will give you enough money and enough everything you have. You give us the map to the grand grand map and help her. So that was a very pleasant presentation and I'm sure we have questions to put to our sister here, Dr. Deco. If she can't answer, there's Dr. Deborah. She, Amina is here, she can't answer. We have Vanessa is there, she can answer. If she can't answer, the director of Columbia University can answer if we can't. My brother from the embassy. I don't want to ask the first one, it might upset you. So do you have any questions? Quick question, now, how do you get supplies? For medicine, of medicine, of um, those things associated with the treatment? How do you get them? Um, really, it's, it's a challenge to have the supplies that Well, you can... Uh, it's okay. You can... Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is a challenge for whole country. It's not only for us and for our hospital. There is a lot of NGOs on the ground, and the problem is we are in the area where we're very strict by government control. You know, still the government government control area, but to deliver supplies, we have a lot of restriction in our region. What we do, we I, I do travel a lot. We have a Somali community. One of our biggest support is Somali community and diaspora, sending different money and different supplies. So we buy as much as we can. We had one strong supporter for this last couple of months, the Cat Foundation in U.S. Also supporting. We have a lot of foundation support. So we try to buy a bit. You cannot cover 400 bed supplies for medicine when it comes. We do as much as we can. Mainly we focus about the children, 150 beds. And we try to adult if they can buy their own medicine. We there for them for our service, but we might not have a medicine to do. Supplies we delivered last year, uh, last a year and a half ago for a container of supplies from US for like gloves and that. So it's, it's very challenging, but we, we try to do our best. Good. And the food for the patients and for the children, that, uh, it, it all comes from the Tichika hectare, a piece of land you, you own, or you also get supplies from us? Uh, we, for the patient, we try to feed ourselves as much as we can, and to the families, we have a feeding program for the hospital, and, as much, and we have a feeding program for the school. But we don't have much for the village. Village, if we cultivate, we give at the times, uh, the land we own, in the farming land and also in the village land, my mother's and my mother's ancestors own. So we can still cultivate, but we don't have investment. And I don't think so anyone is willing for next, maybe, let me say five years to invest in Somali. But we hope that we to get next, after five or six years, a lot of people invest in Somali farming. And we don't have to worry about the food. Thank you. I was only now, uh, 
Now, looking at the photographs we see on the TV in Mokadishu, and you look at that beautiful facility there, the hospital, do you think God loves you people? <laughs> but just I'm doing as a, my human duty to, we are doing, my mom is doing and we're doing our best. Yeah. I think when you do your best, you will get the return. You will get this beautiful work. It's mm -hmm. Your work will show what you have done. So that's what we're only doing. True. Another question from the floor? The floor. Yes, Olga. Looks like I already know some of you. <laughs> Olga is my daughter, actually. She's, a, she's an alumni of this place that works with fitness. Uh, you want to come and help promote peace <laughs> in your place. Hey, Olga. Uh, hello, doctor. Uh, I just wanted to find out, like in, in all conflict situations, we have uh, very many cases of gender-based violence, especially targeting women. Uh, maybe you can give us a picture of um, maybe the number of women who are violated, that is sexually, if you ever deal with such cases. Sexual violence and rape you can deal anywhere, anywhere in the world. Every corner, even in U.S. statistic, every two minutes, one woman get raped. So this is issue globally issue. Just one countries are more worse, and another countries are less. So in Somalia, statistically, it's it's very difficult to to make any statistic in Somalia. Even the NGOs, even the government, if I as much as I know, it's all estimate. Because of the remote area, because of the insecurity, you cannot get a lot of numbers, but we have seen, we might see maybe three to six per week or per day. It's a different, it, it varies the rate. But again, you have to consider about the culture, the culture of Somalia and the culture of the shame and the stigma. And the women don't come easily to say, hey, I was get raped on that corner while I was, you know, trying to get some woods for, to, for cooking or I was get raped while I'm going to the market. It's very hard for them. It's very hard in many aspects. It's very hard for she afraid maybe the family will not take her back. Maybe her husband will divorce her if he knows. There's a lot of problems. That, that's why you cannot get a clear statistic. But since it's a war zone, you can consider it a higher number than in a normal because there's a, a, a known fact for the word is a higher number of women. First and foremost, I wish to thank you, Dr. Howard, for this exemplary talk. Indeed, it was a motivational and emotional one. Secondly, mm -hmm. I wish to also thank the Howard Africa Foundation for championing the rights of uh, disenfranchised and marginalized Somali women in the midst of our uh, uh, water nation. But uh, one question I would wish to kindly is, is it's just an observation, a personal observation I've made throughout your lecture, is that uh, you're propagating more on Western ideologies. You have seen kids as as young as two to three years, uh, you know, are taken through the schooling system, the age of course, we have said. But I have not seen anywhere in your lecture, neither your presentation, where you are trying to teach those young kids Islamic culture. Because one of the major things that has really been integrated in the Holy Quran currently is the terrorism, which is also a key factor in, 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 you know, in raising issues of insecurity in this world. Actually, in Islamic doctrines, it really criticizes terrorism. And you know, it's a bad thing. It's the worst thing ever human being can do. But I've not seen anywhere in the observation or you know, the, 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 the foundation is doing anything on that. So I'm, I'm surprised. Is this foundation a, a Western based ideology foundation? Thank you. Thank you for being honest and your question. Are you Somali? Are you born and grown in Somalia? No. So that's why you're asking me these questions. Because of Somalia culture, Somalia children, we go all to this madrasa. We all learn a Quran. I memorized Quran three times, and I'm, uh, now I'm learning translation of it. As you say, you're right. Learning a Quran it teaches us the, what the terrorism means, why they mistranslated our Quran. It's my duty and duty of my people to learn a Quran. 
And if you go to Somalia, you might know more how Somali people from youngest learn into school. No one goes to normal school without madrasa, without the duksi. The people who grew up in Somalia and grow and been in Somalia are here. I, I am Somali and I'm African. It has nothing to do with the West. It's a normal concept of normal development ideology. I'm, I'm just telling you how to develop a better way, how to live a better environment. I'm talking to you about my medical aspect, my clinical knowledge, about how you can teach and educate the children from the youngest and feed them properly so they don't become, it's not a Western knowledge. You can go and read a books of science. It's a normal knowledge. It's a knowledge you need to know, knowledge I need to know to save our own children. It has nothing to do with the West. And I will invite you to Somalia so you can see how we live. It's not, when I'm talking to this, when I'm presenting you to this, it means I'm talking to this audience who will understand me. I'm talking to their own language for understanding. And it's a normal human language. It has nothing to do with the West. We are Somali, we pure Somali, and we want to develop as a West, we want to develop as any other country. We want to develop as Muslim was 1400 years ago. We want to grow, and we want to be first in the knowledge, we want to be first in technology and science. That is what used to be in Islam. Not today's Islam and how it was translated. So I think we need to take a personal discussion in details, but I don't want you to label our foundation at the Western. It doesn't mean if you develop and have a school, you're West. It means you are learned and you know. And you can quote any ayah and I will try to understand and I will try to quote it with you. But Somali culture, Somali children, we learn first Quran before we go to school. That's a culture I cannot change. That's a culture I cannot stop. Thank you. Another question for Dr. You introduce yourself. Thank you, Dr. Andeko. I'm Judith Otieno from UNDP Somalia, gender, gender unit. I appreciate so much what you're doing in Somalia. And um, I've had an opportunity to, work, to watch a whole video during the high WDV with your sister. And my question is, in Somalia, we have three semi-autonomous regions, that is uh, uh, the Somaliland, Putland, Mogadishu, and Lower Shabele is in uh, Mogadishu, where you're working. Now my, my question is, um, what are you doing in other regions? Do you have plans to do the, to replicate the, the same in other regions? Because I see your work as a lo lasting solution to conflict in Somalia. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I would love to go any other corner, not even in Somalia, but even in West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa. But the issue we're facing is uh, realistically, it's financially. We hardly run in our hospital, and as a professor asked me how you get the supplies, I hardly can provide in my hospital world-class equipment. I hardly can provide a clinical uh, diagnostic. So I'm, I'm tied within my small area. So we, we are focusing, the only thing we do regionally is a conference. We did hold the conference in 2011 for Educational Exchange Conference in Somaliland. And we were inviting, we invited all the regions, all the areas, and all public hospitals to just to share the ideas how we can uh, be better treated as emergency cases in Somalia. As Madam Otieno, you know, a long journey begins with the first step. I think they have started. In the next one, since you work with uh, Dr. Amina, you might participate in opening up the next, the next clinic. Yeah. Was there a hand at the back? Your, your question was asked. Okay, perhaps we have done... Uh, there is a question. Um, Don't go out and then you begin asking another person a question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed. Um, I'm a student in the University from the School of Medicine. A final year student actually, so uh, I actually want to go to Somalia one day and apply to that. And I'm impressed uh, by the work that you're doing as a physician and uh, your mother, what she started. Um, my question is,
for anyone who wants to go to Somalia today, security is an issue. So, um, what am I assured if I go out there today and start practicing? Like, what assurance can you give? In, uh, I think I think that's a, that's a valid question um, because uh, it, there's a difference when you really want to do something and uh, the mechanisms are in place for you to actually do the thing. So, what uh, what can you assure for someone like me or whoever else who's out there who, who wants to be part of this uh, noble cause and really want to support? Thank you. Thank you, Somali. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I think that question is now. Um, you are by your own. First of all, nobody can um, guarantee you a safety or security. The problem we're facing in Somalia is uh, trying to save, uh, for to, trying to provide security. That's why we have been, I, I believe personally, it has nothing to do with foundation. If any NGOs or any humanitarian work, especially local people, especially Somalis, especially Africans could go in and do the work and not uh, invest more in insecurity. What, what NGOs are doing or whatever, if I, if, I, if I tell you I will provide you security, I need to pay a guy who has a gun, who is going to take the money from me to save you, but when you leave the country, you will go kill someone else, the money you provide to him. So it's a question is, will you want to go to Somalia and risk your life being by yourself, or you want to go to Somalia as a tourist and invest a work? and invest giving more money the guy with the gun. So uh, I believe, Somali, if you have a guts, come in without the gun. If you don't have cut guts, stay away from it. That's what I believe personally. Uh, otherwise, if you come with the security and I will get a car with 100 guys with the guns, I need to pay him $100 a day. So you will cost me $1,000 a, a, a day. If you stay a month, you're going to cost me 30000 which I run the school. That 30000 is my school budget. So I just do some math, and I say, do I need to invite the Somali guy who's afraid or any other Western or someone who's afraid I have to invest him 100000 of my budget for his security, or I can use that 100000 to manage 10 projects? That's a question I'm facing. So if you want to come Somali, you Somali, you don't have problem. We have a Kenyans on the ground. It's it's the way you create the problem. And you, it's the war zone, it's risky. I'm not saying it's a heaven, it's peaceful, but it's the way you approach. It's the way people are, people are poor. It's the way you go and the way you communicate. It's just the attitude of Somali diaspora coming in and the way they come in. It's your home. You speak the language, you have no problem. So you, you have a guts come in, you don't have guts, you stay away from Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, I understand what you're trying to explain, but all I'm trying to say is um, we had incidents where, like five months ago, five Syrian doctors were bombarded and they all died on the spot. Uh, we had a, a, a scenario where a graduation ceremony was bombarded and people died. So what I'm it? saying, what I'm trying to explain is uh, the insecurity is not of equal standard across the whole country. There is variation. How is the place that you really have these initiatives compared to any other place or in the worst case scenario. You must have worked there for long, so you must have an idea of you know, how it is. I think that's a comparative thing that if you give me, then I'll have the ability to make a judgment. Then when, I, when work, you I work go. the worst place, believe me. <laughs> Thank you, that's the answer. I we work in the worst place because we have a clash. We just had a year ago a clash between the government and other groups and Al-Shabaab and we have uh, soldiers who were not paid for a couple months who will stop me in a checkpoint and say, hey, you give me good money or I will, kill, I will shoot you because the president didn't pay me. So I work in the worst place, but it, it's the way I present and the way I communicate with them and the way I be careful. So it's the worst place you can work ever. Hello, good evening. I'm Marlene Fletcher from Eagle International, a southern NGO working on capacity development. I have two questions, uh, both related. The first one is, uh, where do you see the Dr. Abdi 
the Dr. Hawa Abdi Foundation in, say, five years? Where do you see yourself? And second is, um, how do you see the plight of Somali women in five years or even ten years? How do you see them in the future? Mahat Salim. It's unpredicted. And the insecurity is very high. My mom was kidnapped. My sister ran away for her safety. And but we stayed there. We go back. We work. It's, you just have the guts. And we see as a foundation, our goal is not for five years. My mom's vision was uh, more than that. She did for 30 years. Me and my sister is our next, might be next 30 years our goal. How we can uh, raise a generation who is healthy, and understands the rest of the world and works with the rest of the world and lead. Our goal is to raise the leaders of Somalia. That is our vision. And it's not about the five years or 10 years. It's a, it's a long term. We might not be able to do, but that's how we are ambition. So that's how we go and we taking baby steps. And I hope in the end of the, the channel, as, as my mom achieved 10 years, I think we can achieve more, me and my sister. Uh, I was born and raised in Somalia. Yeah, a daughter is that. Are you, you know what, when we are, when we are out of the country, the thing is that we are facing is that we don't know nothing about the gathering and the rules and regulations. Did you teach those uh, children you are giving the education what is good governance and how uh, the world is working there? I, I think government is society. I think government starts from family. That's the, my view and my vision. If we educate Somali society, they're part of the government, and the government is works for them. That is the issue for not only for Somalia, it's whole for Africa, the way I see it. We think government owns us. We, they don't own us. They work for us. We voted for them. So it's just a problem for accountability and knowing the government roles. If the society knows the role of the government and the president is to work for us, and we need to trust them and work with them and, and vote for them, that will work much easier. But it, as long as we point in each other, the leadership aspect, they say, oh, this people, this society, and society points is the government is not doing anything, we're not gonna go anywhere. Just, I think as a general in Somalia in Africa, the so government and society has to collaborate together in different aspects. I'm not saying everybody to become a politician or member of parliament. I'm not saying that. It's just take your role as a citizen and follow the rules. That's a big thing. If you follow the rules and you think these rules are good, it's good for your own safety and simple thing for the, the stoplight. You know, that's a very simple basic rule we face every single day. If we break that, it will create a chaos. So following the basic rules on the ground and taking the government accountability, hey, we put you on position, what you have done for us, where you have put this money for the government. If we had that system of control, I think Somalia would get much better. But as long as we say this government, that government, this society, we're not going to go anywhere. Yes, I think you agree with me. There has been a very good presentation. She has treated all this very well. So another mock for Dr. Teko, please, thank you.